The following program is brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novos Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not in fact the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to NovosOrdoWatch.org. We're going to continue today our series of interviews with His Excellency Bishop Donald Sanborn of Most Holy Trinity Seminary in Brooksville, Florida. We've had a chance to talk about the rise of Christendom and the decline of Christendom. And today we're going to talk about the period directly leading up to the French Revolution. And one of the groups that was actively working towards this end, namely a revolution in the major formerly Catholic country or a country they would turn formerly Catholic were the Freemasons. And His Excellency talked about one of their great works in our last uh, period of history we were talking, um, which was the suppression of the Jesuits. Your Excellency, can you tell us a bit about Freemasonry, Freemasons, and, and why the church has always taken a very hard stance against them? Yes, Freemasonry is a substitute for the Catholic Church. Uh, it is, the Catholic Church is an institution founded by our Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of, among other things, the promulgation and preservation of supernatural revealed truths that are absolute truths and which lead people to heaven. Freemasonry is an institution founded for the purpose of inculcating as a type of worldwide organization what uh, they would consider enlightenment truths, that is the freeing man from the obscurantism, the darkness of Catholicism and enlightening him with uh, naturalistic truths uh, or naturalistic doctrines, they're not truths at all, but what they consider to be the truth and light. Uh, they do not believe in original sin. They believe that the uh, original promise of the devil was true, that man will be like God uh, if he can free himself from the uh, obedience to a supernatural God. Uh, this is the, the spirit of Freemasonry. And uh, therefore, the freedom of man's mind and his intellect from the teaching of the Catholic Church and from revelation in general is one of the principal tenets of Freemasonry. Uh, if you read Freemasonic books, you see a, a, a smorgasbord of every religion on the face of the earth, that they take from this, they take from that, and they create a, a higher wisdom, something above all the religions, uh, a philosophical higher religion. Uh, and they, while they do not oppose religion as such, uh, in some cases they do, but overall they don't oppose religion as such, but they say that Freemasonry is above all of it and that uh, the uh, religion should conform itself to all of the principles of Freemasonry. Uh, if it doesn't, then it's obscurantism, one of their favorite words. It's darkness, it's, the, it's not the light. So there was a, uh, this was born in the latter part of the 1500s. It, uh, they claimed to go all the way back to the Temple of Solomon and to the Egyptians. But modern Freemasonry goes back to the 16th century. It starts to become uh, more popular in England, particularly under Cromwell, who was a practitioner of an early Freemasonry. Uh, shockingly, another practitioner of uh, early Freemasonry was the Catholic King James II. Hmm. Uh, and the reason why the ter uh, we have the term Scottish Rite Freemasonry is because he went to France after he was exiled from England after the Glorious Revolution, the so-called Glorious Revolution in 1688. He went to France and there he practiced Freemasonry. And because he was Scottish, the French called it 
the Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Mm. That's the, where the term comes, because James II was practicing Freemasonry in France. And that was in the 1680s. Now, this is before the condemnation uh, in the 1730s of Freemasonry. Uh, so, uh, so how would the king have looked at Freemasonry as, as a tool of um, state, as a way to work with other people? I don't know how he saw it, but certainly it was the vogue of the time. The uh, enlightenment thought, the idea of, of natural religion and of um, uh, what these naturalistic values apart from uh, Catholicism, uh, an organization and a, a source of ideas that would replace the supernatural faith, supernatural charity, supernatural hope of the Catholic Church, uh, something by which man could live, an organized philosophy that was naturalistic. Uh, I don't know a great deal about James II, nor his, his uh, practice of Freemasonry, but I do know that he was a Freemason, or he was an early Freemason, and practiced it in France, and that was the origin of it. Um, Freemasonry became a, an institution organized in England, in London, in 1717, that's its early date. and. Um, was, uh, became very popular in the 18th century. Uh, the, uh, now it's interesting that, that 17 is interesting because 1517 is the, is the Reformation, uh, 1917 is the Russian Revolution, and it is also the uh, apparition at Fatima. Uh, so 1917 will be the the anniversary of many, uh, excuse me, 2017 will be the anniversary of many things, three things, Freemasonry, um, uh, the Russian Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and the apparitions of Fatima. They will all coincide in that one year, which mm. is very interesting. But uh, so it, it is organized in London as an institution, and it is a counter church, a counter Catholic church. It will gain tremendous popularity in England, it will be a vehicle of promotion in England, both in business and politics. Uh, the, it will uh, infect France a great deal the, the, uh, and Germany. Uh, the intellectuals will all be attracted to it. The upper classes will be attracted to it. Uh, for example, the, the two brothers of Louis XVI, who reigned from 1774 to 1793, the two brothers were Freemasons. They became Louis XVIII after the Restoration and Charles X. They were both Freemasons. And the confessor of Louis XVI was a Freemason. That's how much it penetrated society, that it was that close to the king. And there are even some who claim that Louis XVI himself was a Freemason. Mm. Uh, you know, some membership is doubtful, uh, and that's one of them. But uh, certainly it was true of his brothers, and it was certainly true of his confessor. Uh, many, many others were, were Freemasons um, and, and in France and Germany. Uh, uh, the um, uh, Herder and Goethe, uh, big figures in what you would call modern culture and modern philosophy, literature, were Freemasons. Uh, the uh, all practically all of the founders and prime movers of the uh, American state, the American Constitution, Declaration of Independence, were Freemasons. Um, it was a very very popular thing. Mozart was a Freemason. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Joseph II. The, the if you wanted to be in the elite or in the advanced yes. of society, you joined yes. it. Yes, it became extremely popular in the 18th century. It was condemned by the church in the 1730s, but that condemnation was uh, apparently repudiated in France because it was practiced in France by all sorts of people. It is shocking, I'll give you a shocking example. The Carmelite nuns in Nantes, France, embroidered for George Washington his Masonic apron. Wow. As a, and sent it as a gift to George Washington. 
That's how embedded Freemasonry was in 18th century France, uh, which is a, a disaster. Uh, here, the principal Catholic country of the world, very powerful, is all infected with Freemasonry, rotted out, uh, and clergy included, um, uh, with, with Freemasons. And so it, it is something that, that cannot be neglected, and it is a very important part of, of history and the modern era. Now, Freemasonry in Protestant countries was not as active, we might say, as it was in Catholic countries, because Protestantism, which had become deism, rationalistic deism by that time, was really not very far from Freemasonry, doctrinal. And the, the societal structures had been altered sufficiently to please the Freemasons. Uh, a, a king that had no power and a popular uh, democratic uh, governments uh, removal of anything supernatural from society. That, that had already been accomplished in, in Protestant countries. But they were very, very active and um, uh, very anti-Catholic in all of the Catholic countries, uh, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and uh, Bavaria, uh, extremely active in trying to tear down the medieval structures that were still in place. Uh, the, the, uh, the primary purpose of the king, according to the oath in France, the oath that was taken by the king, was to protect the Catholic faith and his realm. That had to be torn down. That had to be erased and killed. The, the uh, attachment of Europe to Catholicism was something that had to be erased. And that was their whole purpose in the 18th century, and particularly in the 19th century. That's when you really see Freemasonry very, very active. Uh, so this is a counter-church. Uh, Pope uh, Leo XIII called it the Synagogue of Satan. Hmm. Uh, an organized institution, international, a type of ape of the Catholic Church uh, that was dedicated to a naturalistic philosophy as the salvation of mankind and dedicated to the, to the displacement of Catholicism or its alteration. Would you say embodied by the Statue of Liberty in, in New York? Yes, the Statue of Liberty was uh, conceived by Freemasons, sculpted by a Freemason, was paid for by Freemasons, was dedicated by Freemasons in a Masonic ceremony. Uh, the whole thing is Masonic from top to bottom. And it is a statue to liberty Liberty for Freemasons is not a, the legitimate liberty that human beings enjoy. It's not a statue to free will, for example. It's not a statue to uh, the liberty to paint your house whatever color you want. Uh, uh, by that I mean the legitimate liberties of man. This is a statue to the liberation of the human race from the shackles of obscurantism. That is the darkness of the Middle Ages, the darkness of the Catholic Church and uh, telling man that, that he is essentially free from obedience to the laws of God. You don't see it, but at the bottom of her feet, she is walking on chains. Those chains are, are the, the broken chains of Catholicism. And uh, she is enlightening the world. Enlightened, that is the, the, the true title of that statue, Liberty Enlightening the World. And uh, this notion of enlightenment, light, it is very, very deep in Freemasonry. It's a, a, a Freemasonry will enlighten the world. The whole notion of the 18th century enlightenment as a, as a way of bringing the candle into the darkness of the medieval Catholicism. I'm thinking, is it Delacroix that has the painting Liberty Leading the People? Yes, Delacroix, yes. Uh, when, you, when you say that, I mean, is this a substitute for Our Lady? I mean, or the church? When you have this female figure leading leading the people or, or the Statue of Liberty, is it, what is, what is the replacement there? Because it's clearly a religious replacement, as you say, it's a substitute religion. What, what, what icon is that overtaking in our Catholic lives? 
Uh, it very well uh, would be uh, compared to a, a, an anti-Virgin Mary, uh, the, the uh, personification of, the, uh, of disobedience to the laws of God, uh, the personification of Eve, if you want. Our Lady is the new Eve of obedience. The old Eve is the Eve of sin, of disobedience to the law of God. And this liberty is, is a libertinism. It's not a, a true liberty. It's a libertinism. It's what St. Augustine calls the liberty of perdition. This is what is being preached to the modern world. And this is what has given us all of the evil legislation in the past number of decades. Because if somebody comes and says, well, I want to uh, have this form of immorality or that form of immorality, how does the state say, well, we don't permit you to be immoral in such a way? When liberty is the, is the, uh, the guide of everything that we say and do. When you, when you extol liberty as the highest uh, goal of man, the, the most cherished aspect of man is liberty, and the highest political uh, principle what you're saying is that any kind of constraint of liberty is an evil because liberty is the highest principle and therefore government should not restrain human beings uh, unless it absolutely has to. So the role of government then becomes merely to stop you from killing somebody or stealing from somebody. But the, the government should not protect morality. Morality is up to you if you want to uh, divorce, if you want to live together, if you want to do any, any other form of immorality, the government should say nothing about it. Uh, the, the whole abortion argument is, is uh, based upon this liberty that the government really doesn't come in and make those judgments. Uh, that, that's what it has given us in the past two centuries. It has given us uh, a situation in which uh, the Governments have no code of morality to call upon in order to maintain the general morals of the nation. Liberty is, is the uh, ultimate dogma. It's, it's, it's destructive, it's totally destructive of society. Well, yeah, I didn't move to the United States until I was nine, and one of the first idioms I picked up from my cousins were, was, well, it's a free country. Yes. And, you know, I, having grown up in Singapore, I, I, I didn't know what that meant for a while, but it is, it is a way of expressing what you talked about. Well, it's a free country. Yes. Um, do what you want. Yes, and, and any kind of constraint is evil and it should only be tolerated. Uh, this is uh, thoroughly in accord with the thinking of Rousseau and the 18th century philosophers, that uh, man is a noble savage, that, that the savage state of man uh, was the, the best, you know, running naked through the forest. This was the correct and good state of man. And the society came along and corrupted man. And that man should return to his more savage state. This is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, he had a tremendous influence uh, on uh, political thinking in the 18th century and 19th century. And, and you know, so you're starting to talk about some of the thinkers of the so-called enlightenment. And fair to say the enlightenment itself, that, that word is a, is a um, it's a Masonic it's, word. It's a Masonic symbol, right? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a way of talking about it. So is it, can we say that may, the Masons really engineered or were the principal force behind the so-called Enlightenment? Oh, yes. If you look at the, uh, the, the invitation list, the list of guests, so to speak, of the 18th century <laughs> thinkers, uh, they're practically all Freemasons, uh, both on, on this side of the Atlantic and on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, all of the, the great thinkers, if we could put that in quotation marks, of the 18th century are Freemasons or Illuminati, uh, which is a more extreme form of Freemasonry. Uh, they're all there. The, the great movers of the French Revolution are Freemasons. It, you're, anybody involved in the general overthrow of society and of religion in the 18th century was a Freemason, almost to the man. Uh, very few exceptions. The only big exception I can think of was uh, Thomas Jefferson, who has no history of joining a lodge, 
but who should have? Uh, he, he would have just couldn't get recruited. <laughs> no, he just, uh, uh, but all of his ideas were completely in accord with Freemasonry. He was, he was a Masonic, excuse me, a, a radical leftist. Uh, and uh, a hater of priests and Christianity in general, he actually took a pair of scissors and cut out from the Holy Bible passages which he considered to be uh, too supernatural and, and things that he couldn't believe. So he had this Bible in shreds uh, that he, uh, and Jesus Christ became for him a type of philosopher, you know, where he thought if he said something about being nice to people, that was good. <laughs> No, he was awful. The, 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 the Thomas Jefferson was one of the most hard people that ever lived. Yes. That's interesting to think of, yeah, Elizabeth Cady Stanton would do that too. Her father was a lawyer and, you know, if she didn't like something, she would just cut it out. And yes. He, I think he kind of missed the opportunity to tell her that that wasn't going to, that yes. wasn't going to change anything if, if you cut it out. Yes. He was also a womanizer. Uh, I don't think he ever married, but he was a womanizer too. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I was going to say, if we look at this period and all of the so-called thinkers you talk about, I think that's a common thread of theirs as well. Uh, yes, uh, morality is not high on their list. <laughs> or, or high on their list to, to flout. <laughs> so, you're, so, why don't we, um, I guess we could start with the all-star, the one that almost everybody knows about. Um, where I guess you could say there's a couple of people, Rousseau and Voltaire. We talk about Voltaire first um, as someone every you know, school child learns about Voltaire uh, when they learn about this period. Um, is there a real story to Voltaire that we're missing as a, uh, from, from what our school books told us? Well, Voltaire is presented as, a, as a, again, one of the great personalities of the 18th century. He is held in high esteem by the general public. Uh, uh, he's a literary figure, a philosophical figure, uh, uh, he, however, he was a, a devil, uh, one of the most evil people that ever lived, truly, and, and that's no exaggeration. He did a tremendous amount of damage in Europe because he was very popular and he had a, a very good style. He was very witty. And people really liked him, but he had a, 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 an intrinsic ardent hatred for Catholicism. Uh, he called it the infamous thing, and, and his, his uh, well-known phrase was écraser la femme, which means crush that infamous thing, meaning the Catholic Church. Uh, he uh, wrote uh, blasphemous things against the Catholic Church and did everything he could to bring down the Catholic Church. Um, he uh, was the supposed son of a priest, actually, the legitimate son of a priest. Uh, and uh, he was jailed in his youth for uh, saying things, precisely what we talked about, saying uh, blasphemous things or th things against the king. And, and then he was eventually exiled from France. He lived outside of Geneva. Uh, and he was exiled until, uh, by, that was by Louis XV. Louis XV died in 1774. And uh, he came back to Paris after Louis XV died. And Louis XVI learned of it, that Voltaire was in Paris. And he said to his brother, who was later Charles X, I thought, I thought he was exiled from France. And Charles X said, well, it's all right. You know, why don't you just let him back in? Charles X, the Freemason. Uh, and uh, so he, he came back to Paris and there he became very active there were actually meetings in theaters. He, he would appear uh, in um, uh, theaters and people would applaud him wildly. Uh, he, he was just the, the star of Paris, this Voltaire. It gives us a picture of what life was like. Now these are the upper <laughs> classes and the middle classes uh, taking great delight. The women loved him especially. And uh, so he was just the star. He was an old man at that point. And, and, uh, uh, the French in general have a, a great veneration for old people. I've always noticed that, that, that old people for them turn into a type of personality and a star for some reason. And they, they took very much to him. So this is Paris in the latter part of the 1770s. And you know who else is there is Benjamin Franklin. He's in Paris at that time and uh, looking for money for the war, uh, which he got. 
and uh, he is also a big favorite and, and a, a super Freemason, uh, a big favorite of, of the Paris scene and especially the ladies. He was a, a, an inveterate womanizer. Uh, he actually wrote a treatise on how to seduce an old woman. Mm. Yes. Uh, he also wrote a treatise on passing gas. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, a whole you know, description of passing gas. <laughs> I mean, it, he was a vulgar, low thing. That's, that's all. And, and when, you know, when you think of, well, Jeff, here we have Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, how much they were involved in the, in the birth of this country. And one is on, our, on the $2 bill, which still exists, believe it or not. Uh, and the other is on the hundred dollar bill, you know, as icons of American culture, and, and they are the the just the, the scum of humanity, scum of humanity, and from all points of view, ideas and morality, the scum. And so the the um, so he is there, and he belongs to the same Masonic lodge of the Nine Sisters as Voltaire does. So Voltaire and Benjamin Franklin are are seeing each other and happy with one another each other. I, uh, I think I remember reading a letter from Hume. I think he came to visit and he, he wrote something like Voltaire's dog will get applause. Mm -hmm. You know, the, yes. that cult of celebrity oh, yes. uh, isn't a new thing and unique to America. It started yes. much earlier over there. Yes. And uh, in Notre Dame during the revolution, his bust was put on the altar together with that of Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. It tells you something. Yes. Well, we also have a, uh, well known because of of the encyclopedia, which I guess Wikipedia is the uh, <laughs> the successor, the the great 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 grandchild of it. Uh, but um, we have, I, I you could say the trio of Rousseau, Montesquieu, and Diderot. Mm -hmm. um, they all they're all often mentioned together. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit more about them, Your Excellency? Well, uh, Montesquieu was a little bit earlier. Uh, and he was the uh, political thinker, uh, very much in all, with all of the views of the Enlightenment. Uh, he's slightly more moderate, uh, you would say, than maybe Rousseau or, or some of the others that you mentioned. But nevertheless, uh, has all of the uh, free thinking and naturalistic principles. Uh, he was the one that called for the separation of powers, uh, which, according to Catholic uh, philosophers makes no sense at all, but uh, he influenced a great deal the American system by this idea of separation of powers and the checks and balances, uh, which in, in the course of history we see doesn't work. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court has ended up with a supreme power, especially over morality. Uh, the president uh, is emerging as a type of king and the Congress, like all assemblies in the history of the world, uh, it, it becomes a, a rubber stamp for what the president or the, the emperor or the king wants. That, that's the way the Roman Republic went, and it's quickly happening to our country. So the, the, his system of checks and balances and separation of powers didn't work. Uh, but um, so that's Montesquieu. Uh, Diderot was very much involved with the encyclopedia. Uh, Diderot was... Uh, uh, again, uh, a Freemason and a, a free thinker, uh, somebody imbued with all the principles of the modern philosophy. And he wanted to write this uh, book that would talk about everything. It was something like Vatican II. Vatican II talked about everything in the Catholic Church. There was not a single thing that it didn't talk about and therefore was able to alter every aspect of life in the Catholic Church. So the encyclopedia would talk about all sorts of subjects. And in some cases, didn't say much of anything new, but in other cases, it would speak, uh, it would say things that destroyed the Catholic view, uh, would uh, uh, criticize revelation in some way, or undo the Catholic thought about everything. Uh, and uh, so it was a, a type of, um, you know, this like the little red book of Mao Zedong for the 18th century. You would quote the encyclopedia. And if you had the encyclopedia, you were uh, somebody and you were with it. 
you were uh, in the new ideas. And uh, the church condemned the encyclopedia. I think it was Clement the Thirteenth that condemned the encyclopedia. Uh, and uh, but nevertheless, it, it it got a lot of circulation. Uh, and uh, so it was became very popular. There were many, many copies printed. It became very popular and was a type of Bible almost of, of the new thinking. And as you said before, the condemnations of the church are meaning less and less to modern man. Yes. yes. So what might have what might have ended something in the Middle Ages is now yes. only uh, uh, obeyed by a, a subset of society. Yes. And uh, for example, you know, Mozart, he's in Austria, uh, the, the condemnation is in effect from already the 1730s, he's born in 1756, dies in 1791, uh, he becomes a Freemason, he is in the employ of, of the Archbishop of Salzburg, uh, he is writing Catholic masses and Catholic music, and um, uh, you know, there, there was just... Uh, a neglect, a disobedience to the church's condemnation of Freemasonry throughout Europe. And uh, I, I think you have to say, uh, you know, lack of enforcement. Uh, the Episcopacy at that time had a lot of serious problems precisely because of the concessions that were given in the appointment of bishops to, to these European monarchs. Uh, when uh, the Archbishop of Paris died under the reign of Louis XVI, one of the uh, persons that was suggested for the for Paris was the Bishop of Toulouse. And the uh, Louis XVI said, mm, I don't think so, because it would seem appropriate that the Archbishop of Paris should believe in God. <laughs> but it's, that says a at lot. At the very least, yes. That means that appointments were made that were deplorable, that there was an appointment made, and this by the French government with the nod of Rome, that was the arrangement, uh, that if a person who didn't even believe in God. And there are many other uh, cases of, of this. Uh, the, the clergy, the high clergy uh, in the French Revolution were the ones calling for the, uh, all of the reforms, the, the rationalistic and, and, uh, and libertarian reforms of the revolution. The high clergy, cardinals, French cardinals, they, they were convinced of the principles of the revolution. And uh, Pius VI uh, told, uh, when Louis XVI wrote to Pius VI saying, what should I make of this civil constitution of the clergy? He said, refer it to two bishops. The two bishops told Louis XVI to sign it, which again says a great deal about the condition of the episcopacy in France. Uh, and uh, later, Pius VI rescinded that. But he did effectively, through those bishops, have him sign it. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's just a sign of the corruption. Febronius, uh, we spoke about Febronius in another interview, he's a, a, a bishop in the Rhineland calling for the democratization of the Catholic Church, making the Pope just a, a type of uh, what is now something like the British monarch. Uh, somebody is a figurehead. Uh, there is a, a great deal of uh, corruption in the Episcopacy, and uh, one has to suppose that the lack of enforcement against Freemasonry comes from that corruption in the Episcopacy. I remember reading through your um, description of Rousseau's life, and I thought it was a uh, combination of Les Miserables meets uh, a comic opera. You just have constant failing after failing after failing. And um, how, how did this, I suppose, is it, is it a commentary on the times that such a man would get to where he was or... Uh, Certainly it is. Anytime someone is popular, he is popular because he fits into his time. He becomes a spokesman for what people are thinking. Uh, for example, Immanuel Kant is, in universities is like the philosophical god. Uh, he's the Aquinas of modern thinking, Immanuel Kant. 
If he had lived in the Middle Ages, he would have been burnt. He achieves popularity in the late 18th century and early 19th century because he is saying what people think. He is formulating it. He is systematizing what people are thinking. And Rousseau, who is just the just is a walking definition of failure as a human being in all respects, uh, he becomes by his writings uh, a spokesman for what people are thinking, and that's why the people become popular. It's not so much that they are the causes of the evil thinking. The evil thinking is the cause of them, or at least of their popularity. All uh, the corruption of thinking and morals is already there. They just need some heroes and some literary figures to put it into print. Uh, that, that's, uh, so if, for example, if Thomas Aquinas were living in the 18th century, he, no one would pay attention to him at all. Uh, they would say this is completely outmoded, or if St. Thomas Aquinas were teaching today. I mean, we see what has happened to his, his philosophy and theology in, in Catholic institutions that's set aside for the most part. But someone like Rousseau, who's, who's essentially uneducated, uh, can't teach, manages to put out, put out books, be recognized. Um, as you say, it is a sim it is a symbolic of what the age is like, that you can have a buffoon uh, pass himself off as a, as a great author uh, and, and he can stumble through. I think one of the most striking stories, and I, even, I think I even heard this in my, in my regular history class uh, growing up, is that the story of what he did with his children. Abandoned um, them, yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the direct trip to the orphanage. Where are we going, Daddy? Don't worry. Um, I'll tell you when we get there. It's like taking your, your animals to the pound, essentially, yes. Just having these children out of wedlock, and uh, quite a few, I think it was five, I think. And um, then just abandoning them, then he went to England uh, and had some failure in England and came back to France and uh, uh, reportedly went insane at the end of his life. And, uh, but you know, he was a scoundrel in every way and uh, proposed political doctrines which were absurd, just completely absurd that the ideal state of man was, was running naked through the forest. I mean, how, can, how can we believe this? And where do you have in history an ideal state of man running naked through the forest? Some sort of a, a, this... Maybe know. that's what he wanted to do. <laughs> yes. he, he saw that as his ideal. And so then uh, the appearance of man is always with civilization. The, the, the Mesopotamian civilization it because, it is sudden in appearance in history. There is no, it's not like you have villages of people running naked uh, in Mesopotamia, historically. The, the, the Mesopotamian civilization comes historically with suddenness. All of a sudden it's there. Uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't rise up from, from you know, ashes of stone, stone age men or anything like that. Uh, it, and then the Egyptian civilization, Man, by his very nature, is civilized and starts to civilize as, as soon as he acts. And uh, he believes in law and order and society. This is natural to him. But for him, that's where the corruption comes. Yes. Oh, this is the, uh, you know. And so now we're burdened with uh, all of this uh, phony and artificial society, which uh, corrupts man. And we have to get back to this as much as possible, this state of liberty of man. Then he comes up with this absurd idea of the social contract that uh, that there the, the government is the doer of the general will of this mass of people, uh, all equal. Uh, so the the uh, the priest is is equal with the prostitute uh, in determining how government should should act, and and his voice has no better value. Or no more value than that of the prostitute. Uh, this is, he just sees humanity as a big mass that expresses its will and the government must do the will of the masses. This will lead directly to socialism and communism. It's a, it's a direct logical path and that's exactly what happened in the 19th century and the 20th century. Uh, so he has a very, very great influence on thinking Rousseau. But again, he's just formulating what people are thinking. Um, 
He wrote A Neil, that was his uh, book on uh, how to raise children, essentially let them do whatever they want. There's no original sin and whatever comes to their heads, let them do and don't give them any discipline. That's, you know, in one, in a few sentences, the gay meal. Uh, it was condemned by the Catholic Church. It was uh, considered, uh, and I believe even the government of France condemned it. Uh, the, uh, uh, it but then this is what people are thinking. This, this is the modern way in which children are raised. All you have to do is go to a, a supermarket or a department store and see Rousseau's doctrine in, in place when children are acting like little animals. Uh, having received no discipline. Eric, so you talk about the fact that in the height of Christendom, the idea is obedience, but it's because you're submitting to what makes sense. Mm -hmm. And Chesterton says that, you know, when men don't believe in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in everything. And so you have to come up with, you said, substitute religions, um, alternative ideas to what Christendom has always said. So uh, instead of original sin, you'll have the noble savage, mm -hmm. you know, instead of grace, you'll resist civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's interesting because even, I don't know how they, they must have been, they must have looked at the time, but even now these, these look absurd as, as solutions. Mm -hmm. so, all right. Well, you know, man is not born evil. Man is born inherently good. Mm -hmm. and yet he know he doesn't adduce any proof for that. Mm -hmm. He just states it, and it's accepted as this great new idea. Yes, yes. The idea of novelty as genius, I think, mm -hmm. is is part of this, that they, they saw these new things and they interested people. And I, I, I would say both of those ideas have severely infected our society. Mm -hmm. But the social contract, unfortunately, is something that even young Catholics are, are probably, especially here in America, we, we are infected with that notion that the you know, power comes from the people. Yes, that's a false notion. It's condemned by Leo the Thirteenth and by Saint Pius the Tenth, <laughs> and uh, uh, it, but it's commonly taught by the culture and schools and universities. As I said in other places, culture is the mother and teacher of our minds, and that's why the Catholic Church always wanted to maintain as much as possible a Catholic culture, more than the priest, more than than any other voice, the voice of culture and custom is the loudest in the ears, especially of young people. We, we uh, observe those things and growing up, we see that and we do them and, and we hold them to be sacred almost, or, or very important, that's sacred might be, but very, very important. Manners and, and the way we do things uh, are all part of culture. And uh, the Catholic culture is extremely important. And the, the, the culture of the 18th century is what we've had, the, the Masonic naturalistic culture. We've had that for two and a half centuries now. And we're seeing it come to its, its horrid conclusions. Uh, I'm glad I'm not a young person. I don't want to live in the world that will come to be in the next 50 years. I really don't. Mm. Being here at the seminary this week, um, working with you, uh, I really understand the point. I knew it before, but I don't think I understood it as deeply, perhaps, um, of what culture means. Because when you're here, uh, this is this is the cloister, this is the monastery, this is whatever it is. It encloses your religious life. It sets up your universe. Well, in that sense. The culture has to be the monastery of the Catholic lay faithful, the things in around them, their food, the way they interact with each other, their prayer life, that is their substitute. They, they can't come here mm -hmm. and, and sequester themselves in a, in, in a cloister and, and experience that. And so everything we do that disrupts the corollaries that you would have here at the seminary is something that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that recollection and that thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously Rousseau takes us back to the Roman mob, as you've talked about, but now it's the Roman mob writ large, you know, the, the will of the people moving mm -hmm. left, moving right, which is ultimately a, a destabilizing influence, period. So if, if the people can decide and it's the will of the people, then, you know, one day you'll have the third Republic, another day you'll have a, a restoration or uh, whatever. And, and we see this played out 
mm -hmm. in the French. Um, are we beating up on France too much? Are there other countries that are facing some of these problems? Well, yes, the, uh, uh, Germany has some big contributors to the Enlightenment, such as Emmanuel Kant Goethe, who was one of the darkest literary figures in history. Uh, Herder, Hartmann, um, uh, Adam Weishaupt, the, uh, the uh, founder of the Illuminati. So Germany has some, some uh, bright lights, we might say, in the Enlightenment. <laughs> Uh, but France, uh, France is a very important country in the history of the world, especially ideas. Uh, the, 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 I think the French are the most intellectual people on the planet. Uh, unfortunately, they're birth controlling themselves to death right now and, and will probably be an Arab country in 75 to 100 years. But they, they have been historically... Uh, the most intellectually inclined country uh, in, the, in the history of the world, uh, and uh, one of the most culturally refined uh, in the history of the world. If something gets going in France, uh, and some idea gets going in France, uh, the French will export it everywhere. Uh, that, that's it's just their history. That They are a very excited people, excitable, energetic, once they get moving, sometimes it's difficult to get them moving. Once they get moving, they, they are like a tank. Uh, you know, they are irresistible. And they have created a culture which is very attractive to the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, when you think of France, you think of everything that's refined. Just the word France. And what comes to mind but the, the finest food, uh, the, the art, the, you know, you just think of things of, of, of cheese and wine and refinement, uh, tastes and architecture and um, their language, their literature. Uh, it just it is, it, that's what comes to mind. If I, if I say some, uh, you know, if I say Germany, uh, what comes to mind is beer and, and, and sausages and uh, industry and commerce and war. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not to criticize the German. It's just to say that, that it is not that place of refinement. Uh, and, um, and in the medieval time, you know, France is St. Thomas Aquinas and it's St. Louis, St. Albert the Great was in Paris. I mean, it just attracted these people. Paris was always the, the center. So, France is a very important player. So when France is good, it's very, very good. When France is bad, it's very bad. And so it's exporting what it has to the whole world all the time, even to this day. You, we talked in an earlier interview about Jansenism, which, which comes from France, but then we also have Lourdes, we have Père Le Monial, yes. we have all of these. So yes, the very good and the very bad yes. are there in France. The great monasteries, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, the, I mean, these great figures in the Middle Ages you know, are, are uh, they're French, you know. You have to say this about them. And uh, uh, they, uh, I mean, they are really <laughs> responsible for the American nation. If Washington had not had the help of France, we would still be on it. We'd be Canada. <laughs> <laughs> How terribly boring that would be. <laughs> Um, uh, and it just, uh, when, when Cornwallis, uh, Cornwallis stayed at home for the, he stayed back for the surrender at Yorktown. But he sent, it, sent lieutenants out to surrender. They offered their sword to, to Russian Bo, not to Washington. And Russian Bo said, no, you give it to Washington. That's mm -hmm. a little detail of history. Well, because they knew, they knew who the real help was. Well, they knew that it was, they were fighting the French. I mean, that, that they would have defeated Washington, no problem. Washington had the insane idea of attacking New York, uh, where the British were completely entrenched, and, 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 and where it, which is a practically an impossible place to attack. And Russian both said, oh, no way are we going to attack New York. We're going to go south and trap the British in Virginia. And that's exactly what happened. So really, that, that, that victory was a French victory. You mentioned in discussing some of those things, the Illuminati. Yes. For those who might be confused, are the Illuminati the same thing as Freemasonry? 
It is a, a, a form of Freemasonry. It, it, you know, it was a, a special form of it. Uh, you know, the call of Freemasonry was a part of the Freemasonic communion. No, uh, it was a, but it was, it's like an extreme form of, of Freemasonry with very, very radical goals. And uh, uh, it was based upon the Jesuit order. It was uh, the, the rules of it and the structure of it was based upon the Jesuit order that was out of Bison, who was a Catholic. So the anti-accommodationist uh, in um Freemasons, then the very hard line. <laughs> yes, this is hard line for this. <laughs> uh, but people who were initiated to a much more radical agenda than the ordinary Freemasons, who were pretty radical, uh, but uh, this was the darkest form of Freemasonry. Uh, and those are the Illuminati, and uh, very active in Bavaria, the Bavarian government informed the other uh, monarchies of Europe about it, and the Bavarian government. This was in the 1780s. Smoke them out and suppress them. Uh, and, uh, but they, they, you still had uh, Illuminists running around. Herder was a part of the Illuminati, and Goethe was part of the Illuminati, mm. at least for a time. I, I, uh, oddly, uh, Adam Weishaupt uh, converted back to Catholicism at the end of his life. That's oddly. So, one of one of a few that uh, that yes. saw the, the real light, saw the light, not not the light of the Illuminati. <laughs> but Illuminati means enlightened, the you know, Illuminatus. So that the theme of be of enlightenment, uh, casting out the darkness, is uh, is very very strong in Freemasonry in the whole period. Darkness is Catholicism. The next topic that we'll talk about in, in another interview, Your Excellency, is the French Revolution, which of course is an enormous topic and it needs to be given really its own space and time to be to be fully understood and explored. You mentioned that America really has its legacy from, from France, that mm -hmm. uh, in some way you could say America is a French country. Mm -hmm. When we look at America today and, and its founding, how is it English and French? And, and how are those ideas uh, still resonant? Uh, let me put it another way. Are there any, any ideas that were part of the early founding of the Republic that are not still with us today? Or have they all had their lasting influence and are still with us at, at this time? Oh, the ideas uh, of, uh, there, there is a big contribution of John Locke and his, his biggest contribution is a naturalistic view of society. Society without God. Uh, an indifferent state. A state indifferent to religion. Uh, a state based purely on natural and naturalistic principles. Uh, uh, this was the, the, the great goal of the free thinkers in Europe, that to, to detach uh, politics from religion, uh, the perfection of man by mere philosophy, natural philosophy. This was the idea. You don't need a redeemer. You don't need a, a Christ. Uh, and you know, if there's any mention of him, if there's any use of him, it, it's it's purely a personal thing. Uh, they, they were not against the practice of religion, but they didn't want it in politics. That is the big contribution from John Locke. Uh, so, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's nothing wrong with those things. It's what they don't say. <laughs> uh, it, it, pursuit of happiness means uh, growing your crops and going to work and you know, purely natural goals for the human race. Uh, it, it's not what it says, it's what it doesn't say. That it is a post-Christian document, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it also uh, has revolutionism in it. And that is that when you don't like your government, you can throw it out. That's uh, also from those free thinking English and uh, French. The, the, uh, it's very, uh, the, the uh, Declaration of Independence and those principles of tossing out your government when you get tired of it. 
uh, is uh, from the glorious revolution of 1688. Uh, James II was certainly the king of England by, by every legitimate title, but th they decided to dump him because he was Catholic and he was trying to restore Catholicism in England. And so that principle became uh, crystallized in the mind of English thinkers that when government is something that is, uh, is uh, irritating to you, you have the right to just overthrow it. That's revolutionism. That is, is in the Declaration of Independence. And Jefferson was, was very uh, clear about that. Jefferson upheld the right of any state to secede from the Union because of the principle of revolutionism. And the Confederate states cited that, that, that you know, one of the founding fathers says that this is perfectly legitimate that we do this, uh, that he, he defended it explicitly because of the principle of revolutionism. And uh, the, uh, the, all of the uh, Jefferson Davis and others looked to that, that founding principle to justify what they were doing. This government of the, of the North has become oppressive to us and, and we want to separate from it. Uh, and in that they were right, in the sense that they were consistent and logical, that you, uh, uh, and, you know, Lincoln at, at the Gettysburg Address said the, the government by the people and of the people and so forth shall not perish from the face of the earth. Well, the South could easily say, well, this is exactly what we're doing. This is government by the people. All of those Southern legislatures had voted to secede. So it wasn't like a bunch of upstarts in Richmond. This was a very legal thing. So it, it, that, when I'm, I'm making that point, in order to show that revolutionism was uh, part and parcel of, of the American thinking, and, and, uh, which is contrary to the whole medieval notion of obedience to the law of God and, and submission to legitimate authority. And the idea that authority, the authority of the state comes from God. That, that is the old thinking and the medieval thinking, the Catholic thinking, is that the, the, the ruler, or whatever, if it's a legislature, if it's a doge, it doesn't matter, the church is indifferent, that he is the bearer of the authority of God. And when you obey him, you obey God. And it's in St. Paul. It comes directly from St. Paul. So it's not some invention of a philosopher in the Middle Ages. This is revelation. Uh, so that uh, the idea is that uh, government is merely a creation of the mob, and when the mob is tired of it, it, it overthrows it. Uh, and that's, that's known as the principle of revolutionism. The uh, French uh, contributed uh, to uh, the um, uh, to the American uh, ideas by the, the general ideas of the encyclopedia, the naturalism, uh, the uh, separation of church and state. Uh, uh, Jefferson said there should be a wall of separation between church and state. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the completely secularist lay state, you know, nothing to do with religion. Uh, and as I said in another place, the American Constitution of 1789 was the first time in the history of the world that you had a, a, a state that did not recognize God. And the word God cannot be found in that document. And that ruins, as I said, the whole notion of obedience to the state because you are obedient to the state because your obligation of obedience is to God. No man has the right to tell you what to do or force you what to do. You are equal in humanity to any other man. If he has a right to tell you what to do, it's because he is empowered by God to tell you. So then, if you take God out of it, the state becomes an enforcer only by the gun or by the, the jail cell. You are afraid of the state. You are afraid of these people who manage to come through the political system to rule you. They have guns, they have jails, and they can make life miserable for you. So the, the idea of the state is not of, of a true obedience, it's like the fear of a dog. And that will create these super states uh, that we have seen since the 1800s. Napoleon and, and uh, other invasive states uh, that take over society and, and make the individual something like an ant an anthill. You talk about that spirit of revolution, and I think that 
that like Saturn eating his children, the revolution would eat its own children as well. You mentioned the war between the states and there it was affirmed by Lincoln, the uh, idea of the super state over what was originally a confederation of, of sovereign states and yes. like, like Athens and at, at that time. And, and then it's opposed and say, no, 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 it was okay for us to secede from England, but it's not okay for you to secede from us. Yes. And the establishment of the unitary state, very modern idea, but that's the spirit of revolution leads us down that road. And so nothing is permanent. That's correct. It, it is not consistent with its own principles for the very reason that it, it sets up a, a super state. A, a state without God becomes itself a God. And it, it, it sets up a, a, this super state. And, and the individual and, and the little disappears in it, as we saw in communist Russia. And you're just a, a little ant in this tremendous state, and you exist to help the state, and the state provides everything for you. That's the extreme form of it. Uh, the extreme form of, of socialism is communism, where the state becomes everything, the manufacturer, the hospital, uh, the airline, everything. It runs everything as if it's one huge business. That, that's communism. Uh, your check is from the government, if, whether you, you uh, work in the shoe factory or, or the missile factory. It's from the government. And you're, you're paid to do this, that, and the other thing for the government. Uh, and... Uh, that's communism. Socialism is a milder form of it where the government, to a certain extent, has its finger in everything, like uh, government motors now, and, and uh, where it, it's, uh, or all of the Rooseveltism, where, uh, you know, banks that are too big to fail, and uh, <laughs> where the government gets involved in way beyond its, its any kind of intelligent norm in, in business and an economy. And, uh, uh, where it's just invasive, it's invasive into the family. One of the principles of, of socialism, which will come out of the French Revolution, is that it will not recognize any institution between the state and the individual. It will not recognize the rights of the family, or the rights of business, or the rights of the church, or the rights of corporations. It will reach down directly into the family, state and individual. Uh, and therefore it becomes invasive and, and stifling to anything that is not the state itself. Uh, just even, I mean, uh, something, uh, uh, the idea of having only men vote. The reason for that was not because women are not intelligent or anything like that. It was that the family votes. See, he's the head of the family. And it was natural that the family vote because it should not, uh, the state should not get into the politics or the ideas of the family. The same was with the states in this country. We still have the electoral system. Uh, the state votes for the president, not the individuals in the state. See, the whole state as, as an entity votes because Washington is a creation of the states. And, and the whole state as a, as a little nation should, should cast its vote. So that was the reason why women did not have the right to vote because of the protection of the family. Now this, you have the father who's a Republican, the wife that's a Democrat and the kids who are- And they cancel each other's votes. Right, right. And, and, and there's a, a type of strife in the family. So you know, that's, uh, it was the principal reason for it. Here, Eric, see, in terms of these interviews, we're on the eve of the French Revolution, and it seems so far away from Christendom at this point. I think of it as either, you could say, a lighthouse in a storm, or if I'm in a life raft and my boat is sinking. Once you leave the safe harbor of Christendom, where everything is ordered correctly, it's not an easy life by any means, but it is, it is an ordered life. Uh, and you enter the you know, maybe the technological oasis, the, you know, the, the heaven of, of the, the new techno world, but you're so far away from order. And just in talking about these issues, we look at, you know, right before the French Revolution, the disarray was there and the French Revolution would provide the new ordering principles. So things had completely, you know, Lutheranism had been an explosion here and there, there's debris everywhere. And you'd have Rousseau coming along with these absurd ideas, trying to make sense of the detritus and the French revolution would become the new ordering principle that 
had that people had involuntarily unhooked themselves from Catholicism and the order of God. It's a uh, yes. It was a, a watershed event, and again, uh, it had happened already in England. The whole thing had happened in England, but over a long period of time. It started in 1648 with or 49, I believe, with the beheading of um, Charles the First. And there you had this dialogue between Charles I, who was saying, I am the king, I rule by the power of God, you, Parliament, don't have a right to judge me, which is absolutely true. And Parliament claimed the power to judge the king, which is absolutely false, because they were not the supreme legislator of, of England. And so there, there was a power grab there, and a, a, this idea that, that the, the popular mob is what judges the king and, and really has the, the power and the king only rules by the the consent of the people which is a completely modern idea the king rules by by god's power and any any legislature even if it's a legislature or as i said a doge or a republic or even a democracy it rules by god's power not by anything else uh, and so that was the original revolution in england then the, uh, the gradually it, it developed. The, the next big event was the glorious revolution of 1688, when again, Parliament and the uh, Protestants who were unhappy with, with James decided to run him out and to bring in somebody else. They couldn't find anybody in England, so they had to find somebody in Holland, some distant relative, you know, shirt tail relative, as they say out west, uh, to, to be the, the British monarch. Uh, then when his line died out, they had to look again in, into Germany uh, for the Hanoverians, uh, so like another shirt tail relative. And uh, George I couldn't even speak English uh, when he arrived. I mean, he was in Germany. <laughs> Uh, so the, this was gradually happening, and, and uh, by the middle of the 18th century, the kings would no longer uh, uh, fail to sign what Parliament had done. They were figurehead kings, uh, whose only purpose was to uh, dedicate new bridges and to, to walk around, to open Parliament once a year, they come in their, their robes, and to do really nothing else but to be a sort of personification of England. So that was the Freemasonic modern monarchy. Uh, that kind of monarchy was okay with, with the Freemasonic uh, popular ideas of power to the people and, and the Rousseauian ideas of, of, of the mob. Uh, and so England had gone through that, that whole period over 150 years. They had a revolution of about, that was about 150 years in duration. But that's not the way the French do it. The French blow up. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's exactly what they did. Now, you have to remember, too, that France was a Catholic country, so there was much more of a, uh, a difference between the old order and the new, whereas in a Protestant country, the new ideas flow very nicely. And, and, uh, but it's also an insight into the character of the English and the character of the French. Uh, and uh, so France, uh, this tremendously powerful and rich country and, and culturally rich country uh, becomes a, uh, a radical uh, and socialist uh, democracy, uh, throws off not only the, the, let's say, unpopular king, but throws off the church, throws off all of the culture, uh, Christian Catholic culture that created France. France was essentially created by bishops in the Middle Ages. The, the, and, and all of her culture came from the faith of these bishops. It was a, it was a country founded essentially by bishops uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, throw all of that off in, in a day, practically. Just totally changed. Completely, it would be like going from uh, being a nun to a prostitute in a day. Uh, it was a shocking thing. But yet there was the buildup. Uh, yes, all of the medieval laws of religion were in place, but there was this buildup among especially the upper classes and the middle class of unbelief and this desire for change. 
Now, it is true that France needed some social and political change because uh, of changing things in society. There was no place for the middle class in that system that they had of the clergy, the, the nobility, and, and then the peasants. The, that was built for the Middle Ages where that's what you had, and if you were a peasant, you worked the fields. And what is the third estate? And, and so there was no place for, for the, the middle class. And so therefore, I mean, there were some legitimate concerns about altering the social order in France. But uh, so that was part of the French Revolution for some people that, you know, something's got to be done. The, the finances were in terrible condition. The aristocracy was incredibly corrupt. Um, the clergy were incredibly corrupt, at least the high clergy, awful. Uh, and there were a lot of legitimate complaints, but the, the free thinkers and the enlightenment thinkers used that in order to, um, to uh, put through this whole new way of thinking uh, politically and, and to throw off God. Uh, I mean, even if we set aside Christianity, Catholicism, God uh, from, from the social and political order. And that was the real revolution. When uh, Napoleon uh, came in, he restored the property to everyone. All the nobles who had their their places burned down and their property confiscated during the revolution. But he didn't restore a single penny or a single piece of property to the Catholic Church. I was at a Norbertine school uh, when in high school and we were told that Pre Montre was offered back to the Norbertines for a million dollars if they'd like to buy it. Yes. yes. Buy it back from themselves yes, after it was confiscated. Yes. yes. Um, now the church again got the the wrong end on that one. Yes. Well, again, thank you so much for your time, Your Excellency. This program was brought to you free of charge by the sponsorship of Novus Ordo Watch. See for yourself that the Church of the Second Vatican Council is not, in fact, the Catholic Church of the Ages. Go to novusordowatch.org.